Hi, welcome everybody. Um, we're really excited that you have joined for our early intervention session today. If you have not taken a minute to put your name and contact in the in, uh, information in chat, please take a minute to do so. Um, as if you've joined a past session or a previous session um, of our ECHOs, you know that it's been it's going to be recorded. They are stored on our Canvas site. So if you don't wish to be recorded, you might want to hang up. Um, ECHO is an interactive community. We have presenters, uh, stakeholders, community mem members. And so we really want you to be engaged and participate in this. But please go ahead and if you haven't taken a minute, turn your camera on so we can see everybody and get to know who we're talking to. Um, another thing about participation is our case presentations. So they're a great way to learn information and uh, gain information from all of our colleagues around here. Please, if you do a case presentation or if we're talking about anybody, remember to keep our health identify any individual privacy. So no names, coworkers, where they live, just really remember to de-identify any of those situations. If you have any questions, you can reach out to a hub member. Uh, all of our hub team has an asterisk in front of their name. Um, so you can find them in chat. You can also take a minute and rename your profile. I know that we've been doing Zoom for a while now, so we all know how to re do our rename and raise our hand. But if you have any questions about how to do that, here are some directions, but you could also reach out again. Um, thank you all for pre-registering for this session. Um, if you ever wanna pre-register, you can always um, send an email to earlyecho at usu.edu. Uh, we are getting ready for our 2000, 2022 year. Um, and so we will be sending out those contact, uh, those topics and all of that here in the next uh, few weeks. We can get a certificate of attendance by completing that evaluation survey that usually comes right after the session or in the next day or two. If you have not received that, please check your email um, and your spam folder. Canvas is where we store all of that. If you have any questions about Canvas, you can reach out to the Early Echo or is also Kurt Phillips to get instructions on how to register for that Canvas page. Um, case studies, we are, that is a great way to problem solve, brainstorm, get solutions to uh, questions you have about uh, clients you are serving, families that you're serving. So if you uh, have not done that, please think about doing that. It's a really great way to learn from each other. Uh, REDCap is where our surveys come from. So once again, if you have not ever seen a survey, please check your spam or junk email folders. We do have social media sites that we are scanning. I mean, we are putting information on. We share stuff on those. So please take a minute and follow us. We have the QR codes that you can just hold your cameras right up and um, gain those links to them. So I'm going to leave this up for a minute. And then I'm going to just do a plug for our, our January 2022. We are going to have Shelby Clark. She is an early interventionist, speech language pathologist from North Dakota. And she is going to talk to us about the importance of functional communication. So we have a great year lined up for our 2022 sessions. Uh, just and we want to just thank you all for participating in our ECHO project. This has been a great way to learn from all of our other states, as well as just get to know more early intervention providers. I'm really excited today to introduce Kirsten. She is um, a PT from the University of Utah, and she's going to just give us a wealth of information about um, low-tech 
uh, positioning devices. And so I am gonna stop sharing and just turn it over to Kirsten. Kirsten, you're on mute. Thank you. I was just uh, having a little confusion on the screen share there because my PowerPoint came up and I was like, okay. wait. <laughs> I didn't think I was sharing yet. Okay, we're good to go. Okay, thank you, Janelle. So um, this talk today is going to be on low tech assistive technology and specifically, we're going to be talking about positioning. Kirsten, just so you know, we uh, it flipped around. We can now see your presenter mode instead of the way we practiced it. Of course that happened. So, um, okay, let's try again. Thank you, Janelle, for letting me know that. You bet. And do you have presenter mode or do you have just the big slide? Oh, now I see it, you're good. Okay, perfect. Um, so this is a little nicer for you guys to see just the big slide and not my notes. So our topic today is low tech assistive technology and this Topic came about because of some earlier conversations with one of our cases. So we had a child that was fairly low functioning that we were talking about. And in my workout, in my breakout room, I suggested putting the child in a standing frame. And a couple of people in my group were like, what, really? <laughs> You'd put this child in a standing frame? You know, because this is a child that's probably never going to stand or walk on their own. And so then when we got back in the big group, we um, that suggestion got mentioned and there was more than one person that was a little bit surprised by that. And so Janelle had asked me to talk about low tech assistive technology. And the first thing that came to mind was pecs. And I was like, I don't know anything about that. How about standing? And she was like, yeah, that's what I want. So we're gonna talk about standing today, but first of all, before we really get um, into the specifics of standing, I wanna talk about just some more general principles and why we position kids. And then we will talk about some types of positioning as well. And this is not going to be exhaustive. Um, the scope of this talk is not by any means going to introduce you to every single type of positioning available. But I just want, to, want everybody to have a general idea of um, why we position and what some of our general principles are. So for people that are not very familiar with positioning, um, these objectives here, I want you first of all to understand the general principles. Um, I want you to be able to recognize when a child might need some positioning and then be able to communicate with the parents regarding some of the positioning recommendations. So I don't expect to make everybody here an expert on it, but you might notice, you know, you might be watching a child eat and notice that he's not sitting upright very well and be able to take a dish towel and reposition them a little bit and explain to the parent why you're doing that. Or if you bring in a PT or OT to do some positioning for you, I'd like everybody to be able to communicate to the parents about why this is important. Um, for those of you that are familiar already with positioning, um, hopefully I'll have a couple of little tidbits in here for you today, but most of it, you, a lot of it you will already know, or most of it you will already know. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is just why do we do positioning? So on each of these bullet points here, we will talk about in a little more detail. Most of them just have one slide, so not a huge amount of detail. Um, but first off, early on, um, we're going to do a lot of positioning just to help the infant to calm and organize their nervous system. And this is part of a framework of care called developmentally supportive care. And then when we're feeding, we may want to be looking at that airway and making sure that that airway is in a nice protect, protected position. If we have a child with abnormal tone, whether it's high or low, we are going to be using positioning as part of our intervention. And we may be doing positioning as we think about um, guiding musculoskeletal development. So that in can include things like bone health. It can include the development of the joints. It can include maintaining range of motion and it can include strengthening. And then we all may also wanna be uh, putting the child in a better position so that they can breathe a little bit easier and a little bit better. And then last on my li list, but definitely not least, um, is to increase participation and improve quality of life. So those are a couple of really important ones there. So I'm gonna talk just super briefly about developmentally supportive care. And so this is a framework of care for infants in the NICU, and it does carry on after they get out of the NICU. 
But really, one of the main goals is to decrease stress and to help the infant calm and organize their nervous system. And so positioning is just one component of this. It's not the, the only part of it by any means. But we have um, decades of research telling us that kids who um, experience developmentally supportive care in the NICU have better outcomes and better long-term outcomes, not just immediate. So we've all seen, I'm sure, pictures of infants in the NICU who have all their tubes and everything attached to them and they're just splayed out and, you know, and they look stressed and uncomfortable and really just disorganized. And then you've got this infant here who's in this little nest and this infant just looks really um, nice and calm and organized. And this nest puts this infant in a position we call a facilitated tuck. So the infant has um, flexed arms and legs and that low back, the pelvis is a little bit tucked and rounded as it would be if the child were still in the uterus. And then we also have the containment of this structure around the infant, which provides some boundaries. Um, and that also just helps that infant feel a little bit more calm. And people have been swaddling babies forever to help calm them, you know, when they're when they're very young. And so this is a similar type of concept. We still are allowing for some movement of the infant, but it just helps provide some containment for that infant. And so over on the left here is, um, this is from a fairly recent study. So these are some images of brain, re reconstructive images um, that were done from some brain imaging. And our one on the far left here is our full-term control healthy infant. And then the other five are all preterm um, babies, but the scans were taken at term equivalent age. And so if you look at this bottom left one, that's that looks more like a brain would typically look at 28 to 30 weeks gestation. And um, as you see, all five of these are term equivalent. We've got some variability in how well the brain has developed. And so what they are finding now is that the amount of stress that the infant undergoes in the NICU has an influence on these all these folds um, that take that normally form in the brain and how mature and developed that brain uh, becomes over time. And there are long term follow ups at seven years of age still showing differences with less developed brains for infants who underwent a lot of stress in the NICU. So that does not mean that, well, you put the baby in this little nest and they're gonna come out with this great looking brain like this top left one, um, but that is just one component of maintaining their stress. And in this particular study, what they looked at in terms of stress was they looked at um, pain responses. And so when a child has to undergo a lot of painful cares and they did control for the really sick babies and how many painful cares they were undergoing. So it wasn't just the really sick babies that had the lower developed brains. Um, but when when they have to have a lot of painful cares, you can use opioids to control that. But if you do too much of the opioids, you're going to have other problems as side effects of that. But some things that can help to control that pain is you can do this facilitated tuck position and it doesn't need to be in this um, device here, but you can just hold the baby in that position. Skin to skin contact helps. <clears throat> excuse me, massage helps, um, and a non-nutritive suck also helps. So you can give the baby a binky or, or a pinky finger to suck on while they're getting their painful care. And that will decrease the intensity of the uh, pain response and also decrease the amount of time that it takes for the baby to return to a baseline. And so again, um, the, the positioning isn't the all-inclusive there, but it is one component of decreasing that stress for the infant in the NICU. So I'm gonna talk about feeding for a couple of minutes. And then we have um, up at the top here, we have an infant bottle feeding. And this picture is from the CDC website on how to bottle feed. So it's like a perfectly positioned baby. Um, and the baby's got that nice little chin tuck. And how many of you have watched a parent feed a baby a bottle and they've got their head hanging over the back of the, the parent's arm? and they're in just full neck extension. And just think about trying to swallow yourself in that position. And, um, you know, it just is a scary thing to me. And so we wanna get them in that little bit of a chin tuck there. Um, as we get a little bit older and start feeding the infant solids, they need to have some degree of postural control in order to eat and handle solids. 
And if the if you've got a child who's getting to the age where digestively they should be starting on solids, but they absolutely do not have the postural control, we can provide support for them. Um, and it may need to be more support than what you see in these chairs we have here. We may need to use something like a tomato chair that's really going to take care, control their head position for them. Um, and so this this little diagram right here down at the bottom right, um, this actually comes from this particular seats um, advertisements. So this one here is the traditional chair that's been out for a long time and that's super popular. So it puts the knees way up above the pelvis and then puts the infant into a very slumped position, which if you try to imitate that position, you're going to find that your head's going to get really thrown forward and then your neck is going to be in a lot of neck um, extension. And so if you get yourself in that position and try taking a sip of water or eating some food, if you're anything like me, you're going to actually automatically adjust and fix that posture before you actually try to swallow because it just doesn't feel safe to swallow in that position. And we see lots of parents feeding their babies in these seats that put them in this awful, awful position. And for a typically developing child that's got some degree of postural control, they're probably going to do OK with that. But if you have a child that's having some difficulties, putting them in that position and trying to teach them to to learn to eat is going to be much, much more difficult. And so I've got a little guy right now with CP and he's doing pretty well. He's just learning to maintain independent sitting balance. But when he reached the age where the family was trying solids, he wasn't able to quite sit independently yet. And the mom said that he just he just wasn't liking food. She didn't think he liked the taste or the flavors or that, you know, he just didn't like the experience at all. So I said, OK, let me see him eat. Let me see what you usually do. So she sits him down on the floor, holds one of his arms to give him some support and tries feeding him and the kids get you know he doesn't have good enough postural control so he's gagging he's having a hard time it had nothing to do with the taste of the food this child just did not feel safe because he was not able to protect his airway so i had her hold him in her lap and give him a little bit of support and he did fantastically he loved the food and i'd already loaned them one of these little up seats that put them in this nice better straighter posture and this child then now has just taken off with eating. Now he finds it to be a really enjoyable activity. But the family was interpreting that as he doesn't like food, but really he just did, wasn't feeling safe with it. So if we're feeding a child an upright and we're expecting them to hold their head up themselves, we want to know that their spine is in a pretty good straight upright position. And that's going to allow them to get that neck in a good position where their airway will be safe. We love to see PTs and OTs. We talk about this 90 90 position that you see in this high chair on the top right, where the hips are at about 90 degrees and the knees are at about 90 degrees. And this child has foot support and this child's in just a beautiful position right there. So this high chair is rather expensive, but it allows you to adjust the height of the footrest as time goes on. Most high chairs do not have any foot support. And so sometimes we're trying to rig that up for kids and a lot of kids will do just fine with it, but some of our higher need, kit, need kids are really going to need something that's going to put them in a much better posture and provide that support for them. So when we look at high tone, um, one of the things that we want to think about from an early time on, if, if this child here, you see on the left here, without any really positioning strategies going on, this child's going into extension everything's kind of firing together. There's not any selective control there. And if this child spends all of her time in these early years that being moving in that way, those are gonna be the pathways that are gonna be strengthened between the brain and the muscles. And people may think that they feel really strong, but it's not a voluntary strength. You know, if you tried to straighten this child out, it would feel really hard and you're gonna think, oh yeah, this child's really strong, but it's actually not strength that they have, it's just high tone. And if you were to then just bend one leg up, you would have a much easier time kind of breaking up this pattern. So we don't need to absolutely control them every moment of the day, but if we can start positioning them and holding them in ways where we're gonna break up that pattern, they can start to learn some selective motor control. So you can see the child on the right here, um, her head is not quite in the position. I'd like to see it a little bit more flexed, and I don't know for sure because I just pulled these pictures off of somewhere. Um, I don't know for sure if this child is actually looking at something or if that's just the position her head and eyes are in. 
But if I were working with this child, I would try to bring something that's a visual interest down into this region here to try to get this child to tuck her chin in a little bit more and get out of that extension there. And you can just see in this position, if I were to put a toy down in this range, she's got a possibility of being able to reach out and grab that toy. Whereas in this position over here on the left, if I put a toy in front of her and she's in that extension synergy there, there is no way she's going to be able to voluntarily reach out that arm and grab it. So we will use our positioning a lot just to, to get them out of their high tone patterns and free them up to be able to learn to move. Um, we'll talk more when we talk about standing, but weight bearing will temporarily decrease tone. So if you stand for about 45 minutes, you'll get about a two hour window of decreased tone in the lower extremities, which can be really helpful for us when we've got other things that we're working on. And then we may also do some positioning to maintain range of motion. So like if we start to see that these toes are really pointed down all the time, um, we may want to put this child in a brace so that we're maintaining that range of motion there and not letting her develop a joint contracture. When we look at low tone, um, what happens with these kiddos a lot as they start to move, they um, they really like to go to their end ranges of motion and use that passive support of their joints rather than their muscles to provide support for them. So they straighten out their arms and they, their legs so they have these nice long lever arms to provide support for them. They lock out their joints um, and then they don't have to work as hard with their muscles. And so early on with a very young child, if we can start to provide some positioning, we don't want to completely tie them up, but we want them to be able to be a little bit contained and, and get things in midline and start to teach them that midline control. That can help later on with them learning to um, protect their joints. We want them to learn to function in their joint mid ranges rather than their end ranges. That's where their muscles are going to be strongest. And if they always function at the end ranges of their joint, they're gonna wind up with, have, with some arthritis at a much younger age than what would be typical. And so when they're really young, they're not gonna have any pain from functioning like that, but it's not gonna be, you know, by their 20s, they're gonna start having joint breakdown if they always function at their end ranges of their joint. Um, bracing is definitely beyond the um, scope of this particular talk. And it's, you, you could maybe consider it positioning and maybe not, you know, you could argue it either way. I'm not really going to argue that, but I, I wanted to just show you this example of these um, very pronated feet here. So these, these joints here are at end, end range. This child is not going to be able to make the micro adjustments and really learn how to balance. They're just really collapsed down and relying on passive support of their ligaments. And over time, as they grow, their bones are not going to form properly and they're going to wind up with a lot of joint breakdown by the time they get a little bit older. And we can take them and put them in this nice dynamic brace here, which puts lines them up in a much better position and allows them to learn to function in that mid range of that joint. But it still is dynamic and moves and allows them to um, build some strength and learn to actually function there. So it doesn't just completely lock them out. Um, I attended a great talk yesterday by one of my great colleagues, Marianne Battle, who I believe is here today. And she was talking about Down syndrome, which of course they have low tone, but she described when you try to pick up an infant that sometimes it feels like you're gathering water. And so as you look at this child here, that's just swaddled in a little bit, we're just trying to contain that a little bit, not as much as we would like in a car seat or anything. We don't want to put them in that type of container, but we do want to start to position them so that we can give them some limits. And instead of having them just, you know, spread out like a puddle on the floor in full extension everywhere, we want to start bringing them into midline a little bit. And the earlier we start that, um, the, the better chances they have of learning to function in those mid ranges. Um, another thing that we will quite often see is they will sit in a really slumped posture and so then their head jets forward like we just talked about and um, and then their neck extension and we really want them up in a nice neutral using a chin tuck where they're using their deep cervical stabilizers that's going to protect their upper cervical region, which is an important area of concern and then it's also going to protect their airway when they're eating. So as we think about musculoskeletal development, um, I think just one concept is any of us that have taken anatomy, we learned that the bones, we learned the shapes of the bones and where all the knobs are and how much torsion there is in the, in the long axis of a long bone. 
and where all the little bumps are that all the muscles attach and stuff like that. Um, but the infant skeletal system is different than an adult. So they don't just come out with a skeletal system that looks just like an adult skeletal system in miniature. Um, and there are things that typically happen through all of the, the forces, the weight bearing and the, and the activities and the muscle use um, and things that kids do that leads to a typical mature skeletal system. And so if kids have motor delays and they're not doing all of these typical activities and um, subjecting their bones to all of these typical forces, they may develop a little bit differently. So they may not get that untwisting of those bones or they may not get those nice, nice deep hip sockets um, or they may not get all that strength. <laughs> um, and so if they don't have strong muscles, those bumps where those muscles attach don't become very robust. And so as pediatric PTs, we need to anticipate the effects of the atypical forces and activities so that we can try to mitigate those differences. You know, if you've got a child that's not ever going to stand and walk, we're not going to completely make up for that, but we can um, help and keep it so that it's not as bad as it would be otherwise by anticipating that. And so again, positioning is one of the components that we use in this prevention of secondary impairments. And just a quick mention here, I'm not going to go into detail on this, but plagiocephaly or brachycephaly, where we get the flattening on the back of the head, um, and torticollis, those are things where abnormal musculoskeletal development that our positioning is really important. So if you have an infant under the age of two, and they've got a really bad flat spot on their head, and we start teaching them about positioning the parents, they have over a 90% chance of not needing a helmet. But if we wait until that infant is three or four months old before we start working on positioning, we, they're, they're most likely gonna need a helmet depending on the severity of the flat spot. Um, bone health, I won't talk about a huge amount, but just recognize that weight bearing really helps with bone health and um, muscle activity helps to strengthen the bones as well. Um, there, so we're going to talk later about using a static standing frame. There are new newer technologies that are being researched that would be a dynamic where you're actually walking um, and and some vibration, um, but none of that stuff is available commercially yet. So what we have are static standards um, for the most part. Um, and then another just note on bone health right now, our primary measure and the thing you'll read about everywhere is bone mineral density. Um, but it's a lot more complicated than that. So the optimal bone mineral density actually depends on the diameter of your bone. And some people have bigger diameter bones. And so they're therefore gonna have a lower bone mineral density. Um, but right now that's our measure that we have. So as we look at things that affect bone health, that's what you're gonna see referred to is, is what the effects on bone mineral density are. So when I talk about standing and whatnot, I'll talk about bone mineral density, but just realize in a few years, you might be hearing about things other than bone mineral density. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk about joints quickly. Um, the hip is a really big one that as um, when the infant is born, it's pretty shallow. The, it's a ball and socket joint. So your socket here, the acetabulum is pretty shallow and it's weight bearing and activities and muscle use that really help to seat the head of the femur into the acetabulum. And so when you have um, a child that's not weight bearing or you have abnormal tone, um, you may see things, things not quite form properly. And so ideally the, the majority, um, if not all at the head of the femur should be contained within the acetabulum. So on this one here, about 10% of the head of the femur is hanging out and that's, that's okay, that's, that's within a normal range. If you get up to this one here, it's about 28 to 30% of the head of the femur is not contained within the acetabulum. And if you get more than 30% of the head of the femur exposed before this child is skeletally mature, then that hip is at risk for to continue to migrate out. So this is called hip dysplasia. And if you can imagine here, if I were to take this femur here and put it into abduction, so I'm going to swing the, the, this part of the femur out, that's going to take the head of the femur and seat it a little bit better in the acetabulum. So if I do my weight bearing and standing with the hips and a little bit of abduction, that is going to improve that joint development. But if I stand the child just like this and do my weight bearing with the hips in a straight position, it's not going to help. Um, with hip development. 
Um, the foot, this is a foot that has some healing fractures and some, um, some problems going on at the joints. And this is beyond the point of where positioning is going to help at all. This, that child is going to need a salvage surgery. So that one is a little bit too late. But early on, we could have done some positioning or some bracing or something to help that foot along. Um, I'm going to talk quickly when we talk about range of motion here. So here I'm really talking about high tone and being able to maintain that range of motion. So this, um, this little schematic here in the middle, this is a new um, classification system that was published this year. And I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on it, but it takes a really complex topic and boils it down, you know, kind of simplifies it for us and boils it down into a framework that I think makes it a little bit easier to think about. And I think this is really helpful for the things that we're talking about today. And so what we see at the younger ages is that this would be CP and this uh, specifically is musculoskeletal pathology in the lower extremities. Um, we have high tone that may contribute to a loss of range of motion. And so this child here is in plantar flexion or up on their toes. Um, and they're going to get tight in those calf muscles. And that really is primarily high tone. And so our treatment for that is going to be tone management. So from a medical standpoint, there are oral uh, medications that can be taken that will have an effect on the whole body. There are local injections that can be done. Both of those are going to have side effects. And so we want to use those somewhat judiciously. But we can also use things like standing and weight bearing, but standing on the toes isn't really going to help. We've got to, we've got to get that child weight bearing through their whole foot. So if we need to, um, you know, get them stretched out so we can get them down flat, that's great. If we need to build up something under their foot so they're actually weight bearing through their foot, that's another approach to take on it. Um, and we can also do, um, I've got this picture of this brace out here. This is a low load, long duration stretch. Um, so there's a spring in this brace and you would adjust that spring to how much tension basically the child can tolerate. And they would wear that overnight. So you start, start out on a really low tension and every few days you bump it up a half a notch. And when you get to where the child starts complaining, then you bump it back down a half a notch. And then that's where you leave it for a while. And they sleep with that. So they get that nice, um, nice, slow stretch, long, long duration, but, but low load stretch to help to maintain that range of motion. And then we've got the child here in the standing frame, of course, and so his ankles are in a good position. And this is going to help him maintain his range of motion in his ankles, his knees, and his hips. And so those are all good strategies to use at this um, stage one where high tone and in the early intervention age, this is where we're going to be. As time goes on, their tone actually decreases. They may still have tone, but their muscles start to lay down a bunch of extra connective tissue and they get a lot of intrinsic stiffness in the muscle. And so then they start having more of an actual contracture where you can't actually physically get them to a neutral position in that joint. Um, and then at that point, a soft tissue surgery is going to be a more appropriate um, intervention. And along with this, there's a lot of overlap between this, but once you start getting joint contractures, now you're going to start seeing some bony deformities. And if that goes on long enough, eventually you're going to get to the point where the joint just decompensates. And the only thing left to do is a salvage surgery and um, just try to decrease their pain. And they may also have a big decrease in function at that time. So this is kind of a normal progression. Um, CP is a non-progressive brain injury, but their musculoskeletal pathology definitely changes and progresses over time. And so by intervening early and being aware of these changes, we can have an influence on that and hopefully delay some of these changes and optimize our treatments um, to time them appropriately so that we're allowing children to function for a longer time before, you know, and, and maybe even avoid that decompensation stage. And so again, positioning is one component of that, <laughs> not the only component. When we think about strength, um, we may sometimes want to position them to minimize our gravity to facilitate active movement. So if you've got a child lying on their stomach and they can't pick up their head and their biggest problem is that they don't have enough strength, um, our gravity goes straight up and down. And then if that child is flat on the floor, they're perpendicular to gravity. That's where they're gonna be working maximally to lift their head. If we put them on a little bit of an incline, like on their parent's chest or something, when the parent is reclined on the 
couch, um, lifting up that head is going to be easier because now they're not working perpendicular to gravity. Um, if we put a child in side lying, um, being able to reach for a toy is going to be much easier than when they're on their back. They're going to be reaching directly against gravity on their side. Gravity is pretty much minimized there. So as PTs, we think about this a lot when, we're, when we want to strengthen. We think about what position the child is in. And we may want to position them to work directly against gravity. Um, and our standing devices will provide some strengthening to allow some children to be able to build up the strength to be able to stand without the support of that frame. When we talk about breath support um, in studies that have been done looking at different positions, oxygen saturation is better when when people are upright than when they're lying down. Um, and then if you have a child, I've, I've picked up a couple of kids in my time who were nine months or 12 months old who pretty much spent their whole lives lying on their back up to that point. Um, and especially if they're low tone and just spread out, you might see you're going to see that flat head um, from being on their back all the time. But a lot of times their um, rib cage is just really flattened and um, and that's just not good for them being able to breathe. And so early on, we want to just make sure that we're getting them in a variety of positions. So even if it's a really low functioning child that's not going to be able to do very much, we just don't want them flat on their back all the time. And so we may want to do some side lying and side, you know, alternating sides is going to help round out that rib cage and then getting them upright so that they get better um, oxygen saturation. And then there's been attention through COVID on prone, being in prone for acute respiratory distress. And that is, um, you know, we're not going to put them on their stomachs to sleep, but sometimes people do better breathing when they're on their stomach. And the deal is, is that it gives a little bit of resistance to the diaphragm, which then activates a stronger contraction of the diaphragm in prone. Um, participation is a really big one. So um, any position that increases social interaction is going to increase participation and opportunities for social learning. So that could be doing prone on a parent's chest where the baby can lift up their head and look at their parent. Um, it could be sidelined next to a parent. It could be sitting in a high chair for family meals. Um, in this picture here, we've got a, a girl who's got her wheelchair, which allows her to sit at the table with other kids. And so very often we will use these um, positioning devices in order to increase participation. So I'm gonna go into standing now for my last couple of minutes here. Um, some of the reasons that I, as a physical therapist, am gonna be thinking about to um, wanna stand a child is participation is down at the bottom, but that's a big one. Um, the amount of energy that's required to stand in a supported standing frame is actually double what it is to sit in a supported sitting um, situation. We get improved cardiopulmonary function. Um, we may prevent those deformities or there's those secondary impairments that we talked about and maintaining our range of motion. Um, and then also, because this is using double the energy, it's considered a low intensity activity. But if you've got a child who's really only able to sit supported um, or stand supported, this is better than sitting or lying down because that those things are sedentary. So this is at least a low intensity activity. Um, and kids are more alert and they attend better when they are upright. And so we all know that we can fall asleep a lot easier sitting than we can standing up. So getting them upright can just help increase that alertness. It does help with bone mineral density, not to the same effect that if the child were active and running around on their own. Um, digestive and bowel function is a really big one. We all know as early interventionists, once that child gets backed up, um, life is miserable. And this can help those bowels move. Um, and then for a really low functioning child, this is where I really see them build the best head control is when they're upright in their stander. And that child that just needs a little boost so that they can start standing at furniture and eventually walking on their own. Um, this is a really good way to build that strength. And then for a lot of kids, you know, if they're stuck in a reclining seat or their their boppy sling or, or even their wheelchair, in order for social interaction, somebody's got to come up and get in front of them and initiate that. But when they're up in their standing frame, they're up at a height where they can see their family members and they just start getting a lot more of that um, social interaction and social participation. Um, there was a survey done in Sweden and this was the ages range from two to 86. So obviously the young kids needed to have their parents answering for them. 
Um, Sweden's got that great system where they can go in and say, okay, these are all the people in the country who have a standing frame. So we're gonna send them all a survey. There were a little over a hundred that they couldn't actually find or reach. So they sent out um, 413 surveys and they got 77% of them back, which is fantastic. And people who use standards, the reasons they say they use standards, that the primary one is it just improves their sense of well-being and their quality of life. Um, they feel that it improves their circulation. Um, very, very common theme was that it's easier for them to breathe when they're standing and they feel less stiff. And then again, that improved bowel function was a really big one for a lot of people. Um, and then some of the other themes that came up frequently were that they have pleasant feelings and they feel healthier. And so I just outlined all the reasons that I as a PT want to do it, but I think it's really important to just remember these, that it makes people feel better. And most of my kids that I put in standing frames wind up really liking them a lot. So if we're going to do a supported standing program, we're going to look at 60 to 90 minutes a day to improve bone mineral density in the legs and the spine. 60 minutes a day will help us with our hip stability if we're in that abducted position that we talked about. Um, and 45 minutes will help increase our range of motion and help to at least maintain that ankle, knee, and hip range of motion. So if you think of a child that's got high tone and if they spend all day every day in their wheelchair, they're going to wind up with hip and knee flexion contractures and probably their ankle contractures as well. And they're just going to get to a point where they're not able to even stand up. And then they're going to go on to that joint decompensation. So standing them every day can help to maintain that range of motion. Um, and or improve it. And if we do that 45 minutes twice a day, then we get four hours a day of decreased tone in their legs. Um, and that 60 to 90 minutes a day brings us up to basically covering all of, all of these reasons that have been researched that we would wanna do it. So it is recommended for children um, who stand or walk less than two hours a day on their own, starting at about a year old. So, um, if we know we've got a child who's never going to stand or walk on their own, I want to get them in a standing frame as close to a year old as I can. If I've got a child who's start, starting to pull to stand and spending some time on their feet and they're progressing pretty well, I'm not going to stress out if it's going to really be 14 or 15 months before they're getting that two hours a day. Um, but, but that's our general recommendation there. And then some of the key points is just that we do this for a variety of reason. Um, we can increase participation and improve quality of life with positioning. And then it is a key component of our developmentally supportive care and our prevention of secondary impairments. So I am going to open it up to questions and I'll stop the share. I think I went about 35 minutes to know without <laughs> before questions, but hopefully we have time for a couple of questions. We certainly do. And that was a great, such useful information. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to just unmute yourself or put it in the chat. And we'll just take about five minutes for that. Kristen, I know that you're kind of an expert too on some of the vestibular function. And for those on the session that have some background understanding that part of the sensory system, could you maybe just talk briefly about how it impacts that as well? Um, as far as positioning and vestibular mm -hmm. system? Yeah, um, actually that's, that's a great question. Um, so the vestibular system is our inner ear and that gives us our sense of our um, movement, which direction we're moving, whether we're accelerating or decelerating. And then it's also our internal sense of, of vertical and gravity. So if we're, um, underwater so we don't have our body sense and our eyes are closed so we don't have our vision it's our best vestibular system that's going to tell us which way is up and so a lot of kids have trouble functioning outside of vertical so like when you see a child who's a bottom scooter um, they tend to like to stay in this upright and so sometimes you'll see these kids they go from bottom scooting they learn to stand and they can walk but they can't bend down and pick something up or they just can't move out of vertical at all or, or through different dimensions they just have to stay in that vertical and so for a lot of kids um, if we have a child who's not tolerating prone there are many reasons that they cannot tolerate prone and vestibular may be one of them so a lot of times if kids have fluid in their ear they won't tolerate prone um, but we want to to move them and get them used to being in some of these different positions, because as we get them moving, we want them to be able to move through different dimensions and not just um, 
not just be able to stay in this vertical position. Great. And, and then um, to, to go on just a little bit further, the vestibular system is really very closely integrated to our um, visual behavior and visual motor systems. And so being in that upright position and learning to be able to look around at things and track things and being able to turn the head is what prepares us for being able to um, actually move and stabilize our visual field. So if we don't have, have this ability to watch a moving object while we're sitting still and moving our head, then we're not, then when we move, we're gonna get that, that jerkiness that we're also used to seeing when people are walking around on Zoom on their phone, you know, and everything's jerking yeah. around. So did that answer your question, Rebecca? Awesome. So there is one question in the chat, and then I also have a question for you. So the question in the chat is, how is the availability of dynamic standing frames coming in the US? And then my other question that I would love to hear your point of view is, how can, if we are not a PT, OT, just a regular general developmental specialist or working on that, how can we encourage um, families to to do some of these things to be able to support you better. Does that make sense? Okay. Yes, yes, that's a great question. And Marianne, you got me on that one. I have no idea what the availability is like. So I've seen these things presented in research, you know, at, at national meetings. Um, but hey, if we add in this stepping function, you know, you get this much. Or if you add in vibration, you can get the same effects on bone mineral density in nine minutes as you can in an hour of static standing. Um, and if you add in the movement, you get you get better effects of the muscles pulling on the on the bones, and that helps with the bone health as well. Um, but but I know that the the dynamic ones are super super expensive, um, and I haven't seen any research on them in a couple of years, so I don't know exactly where things are at with that. And with the vibration things that you have to be concerned about, you can't just put a regular standing frame on a vibrating platform because then you're going to shake all the screws loose. Um, and so it has to be specially made to handle the vibration and then different vibration frequencies have different effects on different tissues in the body. And so that's something that I would want to know if I were going to try to use whole body vibration, I would want to know I'm using something that's been researched in children and that's been shown to be safe and on their brains and all of that kind of stuff. So, um, so I don't know exactly where things are at with changing that. But right now what we have are static standing frames and we've got enough research telling us that they're beneficial, that I do think that they're really useful. And, and I think for our kids that are the most severe, severe and the most impaired, those are the kids that it's the most important to really get these, get in these, you know, because those are the ones that really benefit the most from a standing frame. Um, and that's where this whole con topic idea came up from was that question, like, why would you put a kid <laughs> that's, that's never going to stand in a standing frame? And there's lots of good reasons for that. Um, so Janelle, to your question, I think it's first, first of all, recognizing our scope of practice. You know, I never intended that everybody here is going to be an expert on positioning now. But if you got a little tidbit and you're working with a child and, you know, and they're, they're young and they only ever go into, you know, the, the parent does their tummy time and maybe they're not getting very much tummy time and they spend the rest of the day on their back, you know, maybe add in sideline there because sideline brings, um, brings hands and vision to midline. Um, it brings it a different position when they start rolling, from, you know, first of all, they roll from their back to their sides. And they usually do that by accident first. And if they've never been on their side and they don't like being on their side, they're going to do everything they can to avoid that. And we want them to to say, hey, this is kind of cool. I can make myself go to the side. And so having some time spent in sideline positioning can help that in the first place. Or if you're watching them eat and you notice that they're looking a little bit slumped and they're not quite enjoying themselves or, you know, they're not doing real, real well or they're coughing and gagging. You know, I all the time I'm just saying, do you have a dish towel, you know, and I roll it up and stuff it in there around the child and they sit up straighter and that's all it takes. You know, if all they have is a bumbo chair and we don't have anything to loan them, I sometimes will just take a folded up washcloth and put it in the bottom so they're not in quite such a deep well puts them in a little bit better position. So you just have to like try things and see how kids do in it. Um, recognize your scope of practice. Don't try to do stuff that's that's beyond what you know how to do. But a lot of it is really just common sense, trying to get them in a good alignment and, and see if we can um, just improve their function a little bit. And if, if you feel like it really is beyond your scope, if you've got access to bring in a, a motor therapist, then they can be really helpful with that. 
Yeah, and I guess I was thinking more along also the lines of like how as other providers, could we say you have a PT that's really doing some positioning, how could you bring that into some of your like play therapy or communication therapy so that we're supporting some of those things that you're doing and encouraging the family to say, you don't have to do this separate. We can include it all here. What would be your recommendation of the best way? I, I think communicating with the, the other therapist and, and potentially doing a co-visit so that you can say, oh, hey, this works really well. And oh, hey, I want them in this position, you know, because it, it's really helpful to me um, to, to work with somebody else and see what goals you're working at. And this is how I can incorporate what I want to do. And now I'm getting my PT work while you guys play. And, you know, all I had to do was put you in this chair <laughs> or all I had to do was wrap this towel around you <laughs> or put you in this position. <laughs> and, that, and now the kids do all the work and you're just playing and interacting. And ultimately that's really the best way to do all of this, right? You know, I don't want them to have to spend a half hour working on their PT stuff. And then they have to spend a half hour working on their other stuff. We want it all working together. So that's a fantastic question. I think really just communication and if you can do that co-visit where you can see how everything can work together that's even better okay great thanks anybody else have any questions okay one is coming across is how do you address and educate parents who are hesitant to explore a standard Stander. And I'm going to give you about three minutes to answer that and then we'll move on to case. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I should be able to answer it in less than three minutes. That's that's a great question. Um, and parents can be hesitant. You show them a picture and I try to find this picture with a smiling kid and they're they're still like, oh, it looks like a torture, torture device. But one of the things when I first started in early intervention, I had some experiences where where people had come in and said, you have to do this for an hour to an hour and a half, you know, a day and blah, blah, blah. And I don't care if the kid hates it. And that's just not the way to go about it. So first of all, you know, we, we need to emphasize enjoyment. So I talk to the parents about the potential benefits. And then we make sure that, you know, we might start with just a couple of minutes or five minutes if we're lucky, depending on the child. And we don't, I, I tell them this is our eventual goal, but right now we're just, it's all focused about what this child is gonna enjoy. And so we wanna keep it positive. And so, you know, I have the luxury of having a couple of standing frames available at times to loaned families. So sometimes we can give them, you know, a short-term trial. If I think they're gonna need one long-term, I want them to order their own, but I might be able to facilitate just trying it out, first of all. And, you know, really honestly, my kids who are low functioning are the ones who, who do the best with it. Um, and they get, the, they get more social interaction and the family winds up really loving it. They've got the tray so they can do some kind of gravity minimized reaching and cognitive exploration. Um, and they're just up high enough to where they can see family members coming in the room and whatnot. And they start seeking out social interaction more often. So usually it winds up being a very positive thing, but we, we need to make sure that we frame it positively and we start off positively. And it's very, very rare that I have a child who just doesn't like it. Um, but usually if, if we build up our tolerance to it and, and keep it positive, then um, kids wind up doing great in it. Great, and then Rebecca, that's a great comment that you put in the chat that it may take some time to help parents understand that there's a process to get this, these approvals. Um, so take a minute to look at Rebecca's comment in the chat. Um, I'm gonna turn the time over to our case presenter. We have Grace Nichols, who is a student here at USU, and she is going to share the child that she's been working with this past semester. So we're really grateful that she is willing to do this for us. Awesome, thank you, Janelle. I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. Okay, can you see that okay? Awesome, perfect. So this semester I've had the opportunity to work with um, a particular family. We've been working on just gaining that student kind of provider experience with early intervention. So the services that the child has been receiving at these home visits have been more um, language and communication. And we've been working on more directed and intentional play as well. 
So the services I've been providing are home visits, both in person and via Zoom. Um, the child started receiving services due to concerns about early signs of autism and speech delays. Um, the child's communication skills have improved greatly since they started services about six to seven months ago. Um, eye contact recently has been a bit of concern throughout play and talking to her parents. And just a little bit of background on the family I'm working with. The family is Caucasian and English is their primary language spoken at home. Um, both the mother and the father are working full time and also going to school. So the child does spend a lot of time with uh, relatives or at a daycare. Parents are very involved with the child when they're home and play with them. The child does constantly want parents' attention and doesn't really allow them to do much else besides pay attention to her when they are home. Some goals we've had um, when we've been working on this intentional and directed play would be having the child start the play um, by providing directions to either her parents or peers she's playing with, and then also having play have a start, middle, and ending, and working on facilitating that conversation throughout play rather than just that indirect babbling or a few words. Some barriers we've kind of come across throughout our home visits. Um, the child often starts to play with her mother, but quickly loses interest in what is going on or the game that has been started and wants to move on pretty quickly. The mother has expressed not having enough downtime for herself at home because when her child does play, even if she's not playing with her mother, she likes her mother to pay attention to what she's doing. Um, when the child does give direction to her mom, it'll be for what character she wants her mom to play or what she wants her mom to do, um, but we'll quickly lose interest after that. Um, child also gets super upset after naps and will likely throw a tantrum. So this has also been a little bit of a barrier when it comes to finding different opportunities to play. So just some additional information of what I've been trying to implement in the home. Um, we started implementing some different verbal routines throughout play. So for example, this child loves animals and has a little vet set. So she has her dog and then all of the vet tools. Um, we kind of just let her play with that for a while. And the longest she would pay attention to it was about one minute and then she'd move on to the next thing. So we came up with a little song. It was time to help puppy. And she started repeating it and would kind of bring her attention back into what else was in the vet toolkit. Another um, strategy we've been using is placing preferred items or toys out of reach so that the child has to decide on what they wanna play with and how they would like to play with it by requesting from mom or other caregivers. This has also been benefiting the child's eye contact when um, she requests those items. So I just have a few questions. I believe we're gonna go into breakout rooms for a minute. Um, I would just like some more suggestions. I have one more home visit with this family and I would just like some more suggestions regarding some more evidence-based practices concerning directed and intentional play and how to set up the environment for more intentional and directed play and then how to generalize this behavior across settings. This child will be transitioning more into a preschool environment pretty soon here. Um, so I just want to keep what she's learning at home into the classroom. Is, I think, yeah. Are we going to? Um, yeah, so I'm going to just open it up to see if anybody else has some follow up questions for you. And if nobody does, then we will do um, breakout sessions to answer these questions. And um, we will put those in chat. Awesome. Thank you, Janelle. So if nobody has any follow-up questions for Grace, then just to remember in your breakout sessions, um, just ev any evidence-based practices concerning directed and intentional play, 
how to set up the environment for more intentional and directed play and how to generalize this behavior across settings as the tra child transitions to the classroom. So Bailey, you are in charge of breakout things, so. I just started them. So okay. everyone can just join that. Grace, are you seeing that you have a breakout room? Yeah, do you want me to go ahead and join? Yeah, go ahead and go into it and then you can join that discussion. That will be a great one for you. So Tori and Jake and Emily, have you guys seen that you're in a breakout room? Here, let's see. I got, I, I was dropped. Did it go to, did it send me to a breakout room? Um, I don't know, but I they will. They probably just didn't one. watch it, Jake. They probably said no. I, I, I thought Janelle <laughs> just dropped me. It wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> right. I went, uh, you should have gotten something right yeah, there. Yeah, I'm there now. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> Emily and Tressa and Kirst Kristen, did you guys see that? Tressa, how about yours? Do you see that you have a breakout room? Emily? Welcome back as everybody's joining on. So while we're waiting for everybody to join on, like I had mentioned earlier, we are planning for our 2022 ECHO sessions. Uh, so you will be getting um, all the presenters and topics that we have coming up for the next year out shortly, but we do have our January session um, already set up and it's going to be on functional communication from Shelby Clark. Bailey, is everybody back? Yep, everyone's back. Everyone's back. Okay, so um, we are running short on time. Um, I'm going to just call on a couple of the Hub team members and have them either say one idea that came out of it or um, whoever they had as their person. So Kate, you're the one Hub member I can see on my screen. So. What did your group? Cool. We talked about a lot of things. Um, one thing was activities with a clear beginning and end, like puzzles um, versus like replay. Those can be a little bit harder. Um, yeah. Great idea. Fantastic. Summer, what was one idea from your guys' group? Um, we talked about, I'm going to share two, but I'm going to be super quick. Yeah. So one was to help the mom with scheduling and to think like one, she can spend 15 minutes of focus time and then not feel guilty past that, like to really hone in and give herself that permission so that she can give that good quality time without feeling frazzled throughout the rest of the evening. And the second was um, using an if then. So having the child understand that if I first mom will do this or first then. So first mom will do this and making it visual and then 
mom's going to be doing this and I can pal around with her, but mom's focused on this. So those are a couple ideas. Great. Okay. Let's see. Barb, you're another hub member I can see. Uh, and our group talked about um, uh, changing the environment to um, kind of put her at a table or in a chair or something so she had less ability to get up and move on her own and then um, mom to show her different ways to use toys and build in and switching out the toys but still staying there focused. They had a lot of good ideas but if we only have one or two that's it. Right. That's perfect. Great. Um, and then Rebecca. So we talked about the environment as well, but more from the standpoint of maybe clearing out some of the toys, putting some of the toys away and just having like an area that's uncluttered so that the child is better able to focus on one toy at a time. And then looking at like what stage of play the child is at. And so I shared um, pathways.org has a great little parent brochure on uh, stages of play. Um, and so if you aren't really sure what stage that child is at, it's hard to engage them at their level to build on that. That's a great idea. Okay, so if you guys, um, all the groups will send in your recommendations and suggestions to the early echo, we will get that compiled for Grace. It also is always on our Canvas site. So if you as participants want to see all the other recommendations, be sure to check out the re recommendations on our Canvas site. Um, we are at time. Once again, just our next session is in January, 2022. I cannot believe that we are already saying that. Um, but so hopefully we will all see you guys in January for functional communication. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.